All right. So today's masterclass, how to build your comics empire. We have hashtags, um, hashtag comics empire, hashtag kids comics unite. If you want to tweet about anything and everybody who's here probably knows our website, kidscomicsunite.com. And the two of us who are doing the presentation, first of all, me, I'm an agent. I've um, been in kids graphic novels since the early 2000s. And, um, and I'm the founder of Kids Comics Unite. And Ruka? Hi, I'm Ruka Lefi, and I am a published author illustrator. I had two graphic novels published by Tokyo Pop called Steady Eat. Um, and that was back in, that was a while ago, 2005, 2007. I uh, took a long break somewhere in between there. And I am currently actually working on a graphic novel with um, First Second about creative writing and another graphic novel with Candle Wick that should eventually be announced <laughs> pretty soon. Oh, that would be a whole um, other conversation about how- That'll be a whole other, yes. Yeah. So, but my passion is kids comics. I have been dedicated to the craft of kids comics for the last 20 years. This is, that's why I'm here. And this is why I really want to teach you guys because it's amazing how this industry is growing. And there's a lot of opportunity for new talent and just yeah, super excited to be here if you can't tell. <laughs> All right. So we are going to get into this presentation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some some seemingly contradictory things that are going on in the industry. So the graphic novel industry as a whole had uh, nine, more than 9% growth in 2020. And in 2021, I, I forgot to go get the exact figure, but it's even larger than this. I mean, massive, massive growth over the past couple of years. Publishers are so excited about graphic novels and manga because the category is just exploding and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight. I mean, it's possible that, that it won't continue at this incredible rate of growth, but it there is still a lot of room to grow. Meanwhile, um, Rivka and I did a little bit of research to try to find what the average advance for a graphic novel is from a publisher. And we came up with this figure of 33,000, but I want you to know that this is an average and not a mean. So if you go back to your high school or middle school math and you remember the difference between an average and a mean, an average is when you might have one person getting $1,000 and another person getting $200,000. And the average is the number that's in the middle, right? But it's not necessarily the most common number. My suspicion is that what the mean in terms of what graphic novel creators are getting as advances from publishers is actually a lot lower than this. I don't think it's $30,000. So, and what's the amount of time that it takes to finish a graphic novel? If you're fast, it could be about a year. More likely, it could be closer to two years or even up to three years. And if you look back at the amount of money that you're making, let's say from an advance and the amount of time it takes you, you're not making very much money just from a book advance, for example, or book sales. So it's a super challenging situation. And I don't blame anybody for feeling frustrated and confused. Um, as an agent, it's something I think about all the time because it, it, it truly is extremely challenging. As much as this industry is exciting and wonderful and I'm gonna spend the rest of my professional life in it because I love it so much, it's not easy. So that's what this masterclass is about. What can you do to earn a better living as a creator and have more creative control over what you do? So I'm gonna focus here on a three-step process. I'm breaking it down and then we're gonna go into a little bit greater depth in this presentation. This is a quote from a venture capitalist. It's an article that he wrote um, talking about Disney and, and Disney's business model. Um, but I felt like what he wrote in this article made total sense to me and it boils it everything down. At its core, an entertainment business does only three things. Number one, create and tell stories. Number two, build love for those stories. And number three, monetize that love. So 
That translates to you. What's true for an entertainment business is true for you as an individual creator. You need to become a great storyteller. You need to build your audience and you need to figure out a monetization model that works for you. And that's something we're gonna talk about at the end of the presentation because there's many, many models and what's right for one person is not necessarily what's right for you. So the first part though, I'm gonna turn it over to Rivka to talk about becoming a great storyteller. What do you, what can you do to actually become a great storyteller? I love how like Janet breaks this down. What do you do? Three simple steps. And the first one is become a great storyteller. It's not that easy. <laughs> we make it sound simple, but there, I do believe there are four key things that you can do to become a better storyteller. storyteller. And the first thing, one, master your craft. This is probably, I wouldn't say this is the hardest part, but this is probably the longest part of becoming a better storyteller. And, but there's a caveat to that. This is graphic novels. What is craft? So in graphic novels, there's technical skill. And then there's also the fact that graphic novels are actually about storytelling. So if you look at this, you have Jen Wang, the Prince and the Dressmaker. You look at that, she has great, amazing perspective, clear sense of facial expressions, line, composition. Her backgrounds are gorgeous. And then you look at Ali Brosh on the right, and it's like both of these creators are best-selling comics creators. And I look at Ali Brosh and from a design perspective and an artistic perspective, I immediately want to say, oh, this is not technically skilled. But what she has here is clear visual storytelling. She obviously has a sense of flow, of story. So when you look at yourself and you look at your work, don't look at the technical skill. Look at, look at craft as this holistic experience. So how do you master your craft? First things you can, obviously, the obvious one is you can go to school. There are all these colleges that now offer sequential arts degrees. There's the Center for Cartoon Studies, which is a two-year degree. Uh, there's MICA. Uh, SVA, Art Center, MCAT, Savannah College of Art Design, California College of the Arts, there's also RISD. There's actually a whole bunch of big colleges that offer sequential arts degrees. And there's even a couple of community colleges. This I found this Maricopa Community Colleges has a sequential art degree. There are smaller schools that offer these degrees as well. So the drawback to this, money. They're, they're so expensive. So I actually did not go to college to become a cartoonist. I didn't go to college at all because of this. A single class can run a couple hundred dollars, but usually you're looking at the 10 to hundreds of thousands of dollars for a typical degree. So what else can you do? Well, you can join a society. There's a society, society of illustrators. There's the SCBWI, which I'm actually a member of. I was the illustrator coordinator in Austin for a while and I've been a member for years now. And it is a great organization that brings authors and illustrators together. But it the one drawback was there was nothing focused on graphic novels, which is why we have Kids Comics Unite. So all of these organizations, what they do is they offer handholding. It's, you know, you also have all these workshops. You can do a workshop. Um, I'm actually really curious, like what sort of workshops have you guys done? There's Saw, Highlights Foundation, The Writing Barn, Big Sur Workshop, The Writer's Loft. They offer these much, it's much cheaper than going to college, obviously, but they're still kind of pricey because you have to pay for membership. You have to pay to take the classes. I know some of them are retreats. So you're also paying for the food and the housing. Any of these things can actually help you improve your craft. Next is you have things like Domestica. You can learn online, online resources. That's Domestica, Gumroad, Masterclass, Skillshare, Udemy. I'm sure there are ones I'm forgetting. Please put them in the chat if you know other ones. And of course, YouTube and Instagram. This is like, this is the overall, here they are. These are all the different institutions that you can actually go through to help improve your craft and where you can learn, where you can do workshops, and it's the thing is that you get when you learn through an institution, when you learn through an education, um, what they offer you is handholding. It's like you have this structure that you can work within that actually makes it easier to set aside time to work on your craft. So 
Let's say you don't have the money though to actually attend any of these to become a member. What else can you do? You have books and this, it seems obvious. Um, I don't think it actually, it's funny. A lot of people kind of buy books and it sits on your shelves. I'm gonna tell you something, books don't work unless you read them and not, not even that. You can read it. And I remember I was listening to a study recently um, on Freakonomics and they're talking about how much information we retain when we read a book the first time through. And the, I think the percentage was like in the single digits. We usually don't retain information for very long. You have to sit and deliberately study. So what are the areas in comics that you can study? You have books on actually making comics. I love the Scott McCloud books and the uh, Jessica Abel and Matt Madden books. They're fantastic. Um, you have books on story, on writing, um, you have books on cross technique and film and camera. Film is a wonderful resource for comics because they understand pacing and there's a lot of framing and there's a lot of similarities in film they actually don't see in say picture books or in illustration. Then you have all the technical aspect, anatomy, drawing, composition. I didn't include them here, but like graphic design books. Graphic design books are fantastic resources to learn how to make better comics. And then you have technique. How do you ink? how to color, how to work in Photoshop, how to work in InDesign, how to work in Clip Studio. There's so many programs and so many tools that our artist needs to learn. And then you have the science, vision, art, the biology, seizing, seeing, like actually knowing the science behind art and the way we see has made me a better cartoonist. So there's a downside to learning from books. It's cheaper. The problem is nobody is there holding your hand. Nobody is there saying, hey, make time to learn and actually implement the techniques that you're learning in the story. And so for me, the third thing that fills in the gap is reading. I mean, it, it's so simple. If you don't have stacks and stacks and stacks of books in your home or that you've borrowed from your library, you're not gonna learn your craft because you have to read the, read the material, how it's made, but you also have to read the people that are creating the material that you wish you could create and inspiring you. So what's the next thing you can do is practice. Practice is a major component of mastering your craft. You can't master it if you don't also practice it. And I love this. How do you draw so well? Practice. It must be an innate gift, a gift from God. It's practice. I would never understand how some people are so talented. It's a mystery practice. <laughs> and it's true. So how do you practice? I have a goal for you guys. And this is one goal that you can do every day, except weekends, because you actually need to also create time for yourself to not work and to not create because family and free time is super important. Put your pen on the paper. Just, just this one thing, stylus on tablet, fingers are keys. The point is to make your goal something that forces you to actually touch the thing you're working on. And this is what I did for 20 years. I have severe ADHD. I actually have a really hard time starting and sticking with projects. And this one simple goal has created such a habit that I actually have no difficulty now. I can sit down and just start and create. But also create, 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 keep creating. You won't get better if you don't create and guard your time. Your time is precious. If you have somebody saying, hey, you, you have to actually prioritize. What is more important to you? Is it more important that you get to the gym today or is it more important that you work on your art? And you really, there are times when you're trying to further your career and master your craft and become better. If you're really serious about it, you realize at some point there will have to be sacrifices. Sometimes it sacrifices money. Sometimes that sacrifice is spending more time doing the things that you love. And for me, like I don't bike a hundred miles every week anymore. I gave that up. <laughs> and for me also it was financial. You know, I've had a lot of financial stress having to advance my career. So guard your time. Next is critical feedback. You can't get better unless you get that feedback. And I love this from uh, Savette. 
this she's showing that she's showing this piece of art to her teacher she'd been doodling on the back and the teacher was like why are you doodling in my class the teacher's a scientist she's not an artist how does this work biologically does she breathe air like dolphins does she have gills like a fish what's her skeleton like is it half fish half human i love these questions because these are the kinds of questions you should ask and critique it should be more than just oh this is amazing you really have to get nitty-gritty when you critique and especially when you're in a critique group it encourages you to try harder and it helps you find your people you have the top panel here by kelly latham and it's like everyone's criticizing her but the criticism is affected at it's towards her personality it's toward who she is as a person and finally she finds people that she connects with her critique group it's like oh my god i found my peers so if you start looking for a critique group which i honestly consider absolutely essential they also become your cheerleaders. These are the people who cheer you on and help you develop confidence in your work because confidence is just as important as the technical skill. Because if you don't feel good about your work and feel that you're creating something amazing, it's, it's it won't do you any good because then you're not putting it out there. And when you do that, it'll help you reach one goal so you can move on to the next one. And I love this, this is like the imagery of Sisyphus who's pushing the rock up the hill and Finally, the rock's there, but you know what? There are other hills that you have to go to after this. So what's the last thing though that you can do to master, to improve your craft? Master storytelling is create with heart. And I actually consider this the most important of all four of these. Creating with heart, when you create with heart, there's something that, especially when you create for children, and this, there's a reason why this I consider the most important. Children are so good at looking at something and realizing when somebody's just trying to teach them a lesson or when somebody is trying to deceive them, they see truth the way that adults can't because they don't lie to themselves. Kids see things as they are. So when you create work with heart, I, I do believe honestly that connects to children on such a deep level. Um, but also part of that is learning. So many people ask, how do you, what should I do? What are the trends? And you shouldn't follow trends. In fact, you should look at the trends that are currently out there, because if you follow the trends, if you make a graphic novel about a narwhal and a jellyfish, and by the time you submit it, it's already been made. And that boat sailed and all that works for nothing. So instead, I challenge you to switch your perspective and ask, what do you have to offer where there's a need that is not being addressed? Look at the trends and look who, where, who was not being served currently. And this also, it makes so much more diverse stories because there's something you have to offer that nobody else is offering. You have something so unique. And by creating with heart, you connect to more readers, you connect to editors, publishers, and agents. And I really think that's truly how you end up mastering your craft. Okay, Jana. <laughs> So the next step after you've been working on your craft and you've gotten it to the point where you feel like you're ready to show it to the world is building your audience. And I'm going to um, point you guys to an article that was on Kickstarter by Mr. Levenstein called How to Build an Audience for Your Comic. Pretty not too long and very, very accurate and helpful. But one of the things that he points out in this article is create first, post later. So before I get to the whole thing about marketing yourself, promoting yourself, you're always going to want to circle back to what Rivka was going through, which is focusing on your craft. You're never going to stop focusing on your craft. And you need to do that first before you get to the part of uh, building an audience. So how do you build an audience? First of all, you need to build your home base. Second of all, you need to connect. You need to connect with a community, a specific community. And then third, you need to establish your outposts. I'm gonna break this down for you using a Star Wars analogy. So what is your home base? Your home base is your website. It's the central core where all the, you know, you're, you're trying to lead people back here and it is a curated place. So think of your website like um, if you were going out on a date with somebody, 
you wouldn't just like throw on your pajamas and like head out of the house without taking a shower or brushing your teeth or anything, especially if it was somebody that you really liked and you really wanted to make a good impression on, you would probably think about what should I wear? Um, how am I gonna make a good impression? What are some of the small talk I'm gonna ask? That's exactly the thing you need to do on your website. You need to think carefully about who is your intended target audience, whether it is editors, art directors, maybe it's your readers, it could be teens, young adults, maybe it's parents or librarians, it could be a combination of all those, but you need to think about your intended audience and then carefully pick and choose what you present on your website so that you're really making the best possible impression when somebody comes to your website. And then next you need to connect. So I'm showing Star Wars briefing here because this is where all the rebel forces are getting together. And you too, you're part of the rebel force. You're inside Kids Comics Unite, or you're in SCBWI, or you're in any of the other organizations or the discords or Slack channels that you belong to and you're helping each other out. That's actually incredibly important. So community, the people you know, word of mouth, I think that's like the, the secret weapon <laughs> in a creative um, career that people don't talk about enough, but it is extremely, extremely important. And I, I forgot to mention that I'm using Lana, a member of our community, as an example here. Um, I, Lana, I don't even know if you're, you're in the, um, if you're watching right now, but I'm just showing, translating this Star Wars example to an actual example of somebody who's in our community. And then, once you've got those two things, you start building your outposts. So your outpost might be your Instagram account or your Twitter account or um, YouTube, or it might be a webcomic that you're posting on Webtoons or on Top Bus or Comixology or someplace else on your website. It might be a podcast. It might be some sort of a show that you do on YouTube. There's, or it could be an online shop, your Etsy, whatever. There's so many options for your outposts and you're not gonna do all of them. You're gonna pick, especially in the very beginning, I would say you're gonna pick one thing and you're gonna focus on that, get, get comfortable and good at that before you add on something else. So, oh, one thing I wanna say is that I often see people doing this process in reverse order. I see them jumping onto social media and trying to do a bunch of social media accounts before they've thought about how to carefully present themselves on a website um, to reach their dream audience. And before they've really started building connections with people in, in, you know, peers in the industry. So make sure you do it in the right order. Don't start with your, your outposts, start with your home base. So when it comes to your outreach though, and you're ready to do that outreach, what can you do? Basically, I would boil it down to either entertaining people or providing value or both. And I'm gonna provide a few examples of this. So entertaining people could be as simple as having an Instagram comic where you publish stuff that makes people smile or makes people laugh or just intrigues them or just amazes them. Whatever it is, you, you have some purpose that you're doing on your Instagram account and you're publishing on a regular basis to do that thing for those people. This really came home to me when I was first, this was years ago, I was working with my husband, who's a photographer, um, and I was helping to run his business. I was in charge of the social media and I really had no idea how to do social media or what I was doing at all. And so I kind of posted randomly and was trying to put pretty pictures on our Instagram and um, Facebook and everywhere where we were posting images. And then one time I was at a networking event and somebody came up to me and they're like, you know what, Joe's photographs just make me smile. They really, I, I so appreciate that you guys do that. And it was like a eureka moment for me. I realized that's my goal. My sole goal in social media for my husband is to post pictures that touch people and make them smile. So that's how I filter everything. And that's what I try to do on the social media account at that time. But your, your purpose might be something different. Maybe your purpose is to teach people there's a million things you can do, but you have to have that goal. 
Or here's another fascinating example of entertaining people. So this is Ngozi Ukazu, the author of Check, Please. And what's really cool about this graphic novel, she was incredibly creative with her social media marketing. And one thing that she did is she created Twitter accounts for her characters. So her characters in the story were actually tweeting and people could interact with the characters. This is something you can do nowadays that you never could have done 20 or 30 years ago. It's amazing. People loved it. And Ngozi Ukazu's um, Check, Please was one of the highest funding Kickstarters of all time. So it can be very effective. And then another thing you could do is you could post on Webtoons to build an audience and then try to drive people back. This is Coco Uberkerk. Her uh, web comic is called Exception and it's incredibly popular on Webtoons. So basically, it's like you're taking publishing into your own hands. You're going to um, a platform like Webtoons or Tapas, serializing your work. I would recommend that you have it serialized on your website as well and you use the outposts, the webtoons or the tapas to drive people back to your website. Or you could do something like this creator, Rainy Loon, who has a pretty big um, Instagram following and she's an awesome Patreon. She does not blog very often. She, I feel like when I looked at her website, I saw maybe like two blog posts a year. But when she blogs, oh my God, she blogs in the most amazing way. So she, as you can see her recent posts, she had one um, in 2021 that says, how I used Patreon to start a cult and why every creator should. And then she had another post the year before that said, why your Instagram engagement kind of sucks right now. And these are lengthy posts where she breaks down what she's done successfully, what she's done that has failed. She talks about why it's hard. She's very honest. She like basically pulls back the curtains and shows you behind the scenes. And because these posts are so in-depth and so incredibly useful, people share them like crazy. They go viral. She has a gigantic audience because of a literally a handful of blog posts. So you don't have to be posting nonstop. I think people feel like, oh my God, I can't handle the social media machine or blogging every week. It, it varies completely. You just have to have a plan. That's the important part. The plan is the important part. So, all right. And then YouTube, here's a YouTube show, JP Kubert, who does these incredible step-by-step -step videos. So his audience is really fellow creators. He's trying to help out his fellow creators. He's not and just like um, Rainy Moon is the same. And I think sometimes people feel like, well, my audience is really kids. Why would I wanna be posting for my fellow creators? It all goes back to that community and what goes around comes around. It is more effective than you could ever imagine to just help your people. So whatever works for you among these ideas, pick and choose. The key principles to remember is just start small. I, like I said, I would recommend just starting with one thing that you're doing in terms of outreach. Be consistent in whatever that means for you, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, or you have a plan for two incredible blog posts a year, whatever that is. And three, make it easy for people to stay in touch with you. My recommendation is that you have a newsletter sign up on your website. So if somebody is a fan, they can sign up for your mailing list. And that way, even if you're only sending out a handful of emails a year, you are collecting people's information. So you're in control. Instagram is in control of your Instagram account. They have an algorithm. They limit who sees your posts, but you own your email list. You have a direct connection to those people. You're able to communicate with them whenever you want. That is a gigantic difference. And that's why I always recommend that you have a, an email sign up. And then finally, we're getting to the last stage, which is monetizing your work, figuring out how are you going to make money? So here's two articles. The one on the left from the Technium is an article called 1000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly, um, who was, I think, one of the founders of Wired Magazine. Very, very famous viral article about how creators can make a living from just 1,000 fans. 
And in this article, he basically breaks it down and talks about it. And then there's another article from um, this, they're a venture capital um, firm, A16Z, called the 100 true fans model, which is updated for what they call Web 3.0, which basically suggests, according to them, that you could actually make a living from 100 fans, not 1,000 fans. And I recommend that you go check out both of these articles. They're super interesting. But basically, the idea is that you have your free audience, that could be your webcomic audience, your social media audience, your blog audience, whatever it is. And then you have the people who maybe support you on Kickstarter or support you on Patreon, or they buy your zines, or they buy from your online shop or something like that. And then you have your high value. This might be schools that hire you for school visits and pay you $500,000 or $1,000 or $1, for a visit. It might be, um, people who do commissions or you sell original art for several hundred dollars a piece. Um, or it might be a book deal that where a publisher pays you $30,000 as an advance or $60,000 as an advance or whatever it might be. So you think of your, your um, income as a, as a pyramid and how are you gonna build each level of the pyramid? So this is a quote from Lee Jean, the author who uh, wrote the 100 True Fans article. Today, creators can effectively make more money off fewer fans because of the internet, because distribution has changed, and because you have the same power, essentially, that Disney does. You don't have the same money, but you have the same ability to reach individual people, fans, and readers. So keep in mind that there are only two types of things that you can sell. You can sell products or you can sell services. And it all depends on you and what works for you personally. So products that you could sell might be posters and prints. It could be stickers, pins, hoodies, t-shirts. It could be original art or commissions. It could be digital downloads of some sort and the sky's the limit there. Think outside the box. It could be zines or eBooks. And of course, your graphic novels. And so I just want to show you just a few examples of how different creators go about this in really different ways. So Zen Pencils is an Australian creator who started this website where he posted these amazing comics that are about, they're, they're biographical uh, comics about inspiring people from like Albert Einstein to um, Helen Keller or any incredible people throughout history. And they're really well researched, they're funny, they're touching, they're just awesome. And he built an audience because people, nobody was doing anything like this. It was completely unique. And he monetized it with a poster shop where he would sell posters of these, th these actual comics. He made posters of the whole entire comic. So you'd buy a big poster that you could put on your wall of somebody who really inspires you. And he did, he did really well. Now he has a book deal and he's, I, I think Scholastic is publishing. I can't remember who his publisher in the US is, but um, this is what he started with. And it's a really interesting and unique thing that he was doing. So this goes back to don't, you, you get ideas from what other people are doing, but you can do it in your own way. And then another example I wanna show you is um, a, comics artist whose work I saw at Anime New York City a couple years ago, who curates his work in an amazing way. So he has a beautiful website and he's really focused on selling original art. And his website looks polished, it looks beautiful. And it sort of reminds me of um, a story I tell sometimes about me buying a piece of jewelry from a, cre a creator on Etsy, which I thought was really beautiful, but her online shop, I felt like, well, first of all, it's Etsy. She doesn't have control over Etsy, right? She doesn't, it's not on her own website. And I was thinking to myself after I purchased this from her, and I, I don't remember what it was, it was like $20 or something like this. And I thought to myself, if this had come inside of a Tiffany box in a Tiffany bag, and I went into uh, a Tiffany store to buy it, my perception of the value of this piece of jewelry would be completely different. And that's what I'm trying to explain to you is that perceptions matter when it comes to making money. And 
if you want to sell your art, I highly recommend that you invest a little money in your website and make it look really beautiful and think about how when people come to your website, you want them to feel like, oh yeah, $350, that's totally makes sense. I'm going to pay $350 for this piece of art. So do that and you will your average um, income per piece of art that you're going to sell is going to go way up. And then finally, digital downloads. So this is a guy who is a, known for his um, fonts for comics creators, and he's amazingly talented. He just came out with a book, The Essential Guide to Comic Book Lettering. Uh, but so you don't have to just sell um, products in the typical way that we think of them. Maybe you're really good at some specific thing that you could sell. Maybe it could be an ebook that is a how-to in some for some niche audience or it could be fonts like this. Maybe you design websites, whatever it might be, you can productize whatever your knowledge is and sell it on your website. And now let's talk a little bit about services that you can sell. So I'm gonna break these down into a couple categories. You can teach, you could do consulting or mentoring, you could do speaking engagements. When, when I say speaking engagements, in, in the field that we're talking about, kids graphic novels, that's most often gonna be school visits or library visits or whatever, in some sort of organization brings you in to do workshops. Um, or it could be freelance work of some kind. And I'm, this is Rivka's website and I'm showing the example of how she sells her services as a graphic novel pitch doctor. So that's something she loves to do. And, she has it as a service that she sells on her website. Or another example is my client Misako Rocks who teaches kids. So she does these um, manga lessons. I think she teaches twice a week and people can sign up on this special website she created for it. She has her own community just like we have in Kids um, Comics Unite. And what's awesome about it is that because she is talking to her target audience for her books, Every single week, she has a very strong sense of what they like, what they talk about, how they talk. I remember when we were working on a script for her graphic novel that she, we were even talking about slang that kids use nowadays that they didn't use like back when I was in middle school. And like, what should we use contemporary slang? Is that gonna make the book feel out of date? But it's really cool when you are talking directly with kids all the time. Or maybe you have some sort of an, a program where you teach um, creators, just like Larissa Morantz does through the OC Art Studios. So there's the, you know, all different ways that you can think about how to package your services. Or I, here's an example from another Kids Comics Unite member, Shanda McCloskey. Um, Shanda has a podcast about author visits and she is really good at marketing her services to schools and getting school visits that pay her quite well. And you can take a look at her website, look at how she structures it on her um, school visit page. Tip is that if you're interested in school visits, I recommend that you Google school visits and then like think of some other keywords to add, tag onto there and see what other authors are posting on their websites, whatever's on the first page of Google. Those are obviously pages that Google is showing to a lot of people. So you get a good sense of how other creators present themselves to make them appealing themselves appealing to schools. And you'll get ideas from that that you can use for your own school visit page on your website. And another thing is, you don't have to wait until you have a published book to start doing school visits. Even if you're already just working on your um, project, schools are excited about bringing in artists and writers from the community. And so you can start doing it even before you have a published book. And, and you can even charge money for it. So things to remember, taking this, we're gonna sort of go big picture again. Persistence and commitment is more important than innate talent. As we, uh, the, a story that I have told is that when I started in graphic novel publishing back in the early 2000s, I always think about these two creators that I worked with back then um, one of them was just a natural born talent, like incredible artist. The other one, 
needed a lot of work, a lot of um, critical feedback, a lot of critiquing, a lot of back and forth to like shape it up. Um, and over the years, I've watched those two creators' careers and they have really diverged. Interestingly, the one who has the, what I would say is just like incredible natural talent actually isn't publishing anything right now. And the other creator who needed so much help and really wasn't quite there yet back then is experiencing tremendous success. And I attribute it really more to mindset than anything else because the one, the creator who was so naturally talented, I feel like they just, anytime they got criticism, it just like threw them into a tailspin. So really paying attention to your mindset and taking care of yourself and realizing that we all experience rejection. As an agent, my job is like professional rejection taker. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how many rejections I deal with in my inbox every single week. Um, but we all get rejection, but that, just keep going, keep going, keep at it because you can do it. Can I add to that too? Yes. Because I persisted for 20 years and it's taken that long. And partly because of financial stuff, I didn't have a family that could send me to college and I didn't want to go to that sort of debt. Um, and I always had to find ways to pay the bills while I was learning, but I literally, was like, I would work temp work for three months. I would save up as much money as I could. And I would take off for a month and work on my craft. And I repeated that for seven years while I lived in New York. And that persistence has paid off. I am now am a living, working, I create for a living. And that it, it persistence, it did. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does mean like you're probably going to have to get, you know, you still have to have another job maybe um, for a while. It could take a while. Some people get there faster. Some people take longer. Um, but if you're really dedicated, uh, it, it does. You find a way. Yeah. And my next point, Rivka, actually goes to what you were just saying. Everything is learnable. You were talking about how you would save up your money and then go invest it in a class or in something to help mm -hmm. yourself. So really everything is learnable. It feels like a gigantic mountain that you have to climb, but just focus on what's right in front of you. Figure out what you need to learn to, in order to get take that next baby step. Find whatever's out there that you can use to learn it. And then you'll just keep taking baby steps. I'm doing the same thing myself, you know, as I, in my career. I, I've learned a lot, but I still have a lot to learn and I just have to figure it out as I go. Yeah. You can learn on the job too. Like if it's, yeah. even if you're not creating books, I learned so much. I worked at HarperCollins. I ran my own publishing company. I had my own, I have, I've worked in PR and marketing. All those things have actually helped me in the long run. And that was, that was learning as well. Yeah. And then the next thing is what we've talked about. We've hammered this home in this presentation, but Finding your people is so important. Yeah. I, I honestly believe you can't do it on, by yourself. You just have to find your people. And it might be just a small critique group. Or maybe you're, you're extroverted like me and you want to be part of a big community and you want to be out there going to every show and meeting lots of people. It, 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 there's introverted people and there's extroverted people. Um, but even for the introverted people, I would say that having a small core group of people who understand what you're doing and support you is pretty critical. Yeah. As a self-proclaimed introvert, <laughs> Shanna, yeah. I think we learned, actually learned from the pandemic. I need my people still, um, whether you're extroverted or intro introverted, um, connecting with people on a deep level is part of our humanity. Um, and it's just, it's hard for me to talk to people who are strangers and aren't in a circle that I'm interested in, but when you create, connect with people on a creative level, there's something so magical that happens there. It is, it's, it's earth shattering. <laughs> and another thing I want to say is that keep in mind that the people who you think of as being hugely successful today, they weren't always like that. So I met Raina Telgemeier when she hadn't published a single thing. I just saw a mini comic. And, you know, now Raina Telgemeier is huge, but back then she was, she was a nobody pretty much, but she had friends in the industry, you know, Kazuki Buishi and Raina Telgemeier, they know each other, um, Dave Roman and John Green, they know each other. There's, there's like little circles of people who have known each other for a long time and help each other out. And so you never know which one of your peer group, you know, your critique group members 
um, they're gonna get a book deal and then they're gonna mention to their publisher, hey, I know this artist, I think their work is really good, you should check it out. That happens a lot in the industry. So you just don't know who's gonna give you a leg up at some point down the road. So if you can be persistent and commit to your work and you could be part of a community of kindred spirits and connect with your audience, then you can acquire the tools that you need to tell your story effectively. You can connect with your readers in a genuine way, make more money, get published, and have an impact on the audience that you care about. So that was our masterclass for today. I hope it was useful. And um, I do want to say, though, that I know this, we went we're super duper fast over all this stuff. This was a high level, like double speed kind of overview of what it takes to success to, to succeed in kids' graphic novels. That's why so they're recorded, say, though, because you can always go back and rewatch it. <laughs> that's true. That's true. We are, we are recording this. So we're going to be posting the replay. But uh, if you want to go deeper, the reason why we're doing this masterclass is the same reason we did it last year, the same reason from the year before, which is we're launching the intensive course. And it is actually starting next week. Oh my gosh, I had to think about it. It starts on Tuesday. It begins on March 1st. So Kids Comics Intensive. Shout out for Jade Vaughn. She did all of our graphics. She is the amazing behind the scenes artist who makes Kids Comics Unite so friendly and colorful and inviting and fabulous. Um, and she created this Kids Comics intensive graphic, which we, we cried. <laughs> I cried. Uh, yeah, that's the story. I cried when I saw it because <laughs> It's when yeah. you've been trying to realize your dream for so long, but then there is something, there's something like, I think when you're like a writer creating a picture book and you send it off and you're like, oh, what's going to happen? You get the illustrations back and they're even better than you realized. There's that emotional upwelling of seeing your vision realized. And I suddenly understand that having been an artist, now I understand it from the other perspective, like Jade, our, our graphic, our art director and um, artist Jade is absolutely phenomenal. We love you, Jade. <laughs> And Jade, I met in the intensive. Yay, I just remembered that, of course, wow. Okay, so what is Kids Comics Intensive? It is a live hands-on course uh, covering everything that we talked about in this presentation, but in much greater depth. So session one, it, they're both 10 weeks. There's gonna be a session one and a session two. This is a big change from what I did in the past two years. In the past two years, I only had a, a single intensive which focused on craft in the beginning and then it focused on marketing, publishing and business in the second half. And I got a lot of people asking me like, I loved the craft section, could we go a little deeper there? And so I decided that what I would do is break it into two separate courses. You can either enroll for one or the other or you can enroll in both. And there's a discount if you enroll in both and we'll show you all those payment details at the end. Um, but what exactly, how, how is it structured? So basically it's every week for 10 weeks, each session, it's a live lesson on Tuesday. And then it is, um, we have a small critique group. We are going to curate little groups. It'll usually around three or four people in your group. So you have an intimate, um, space where you, you can work with a, a small group and really get to know each other's work and give much more in-depth feedback on each other's work. And then there's going to be group coaching, which happens on Thursdays um, with either Rivka or me or both of us. We'll, we'll be trying to both be there as often as possible during the group coaching and critique calls. And then we'll have weekly assignments. So you are going to be making, if you do the work that you cannot not make progress <laughs> during this course. We have structured it so that by the end of the course, if you do all the assignments and you show up, you will have something completely new at the end yeah. to show for everything that you've done. And I actually structured mine. I started out by assignments. <laughs> 
I was like, okay, what can somebody make in a reasonable amount of time that will help them improve on a week by week basis? And then I actually engineered the course based on the progress that you're making. So every week there's a new lesson that is specifically targeted on implementing that practice. And so, and then the final thing is the online community, um, which is you already have experienced inside Kids Comics Unite. The funny thing about Kids Comics Unite is that I feel like, um, I love the Kids Comics Unite general community, but there's it's almost like there's a secret hidden community inside of the general community because the people who are inside of Kids Comics Studio, which is our membership program, or the people who are inside of the intensive course have a, a much more intense interaction even than what you see inside of Kids Comics Unite. There's live events happening every single week and lots of conversation, lots of back and forth showing each other showing work to each other and getting feedback on each other's work. So that really helps. And that's another huge, huge asset of um, the Kids Comics Intensive Program. So I'm not gonna read through the syllabus. I just wanna show this to you. The syllabus for both the intensive craft session and then the intensive marketing, publishing and business session is on our website now. So you can go on the Kids Comics Unite website and you'll be able to read through this again and think about it. Um, I Here's the syllabus for the session that I'm going to be teaching. Again, I don't want to waste time reading through all of this, but I actually wouldn't mind going through the syllabus a little bit because I feel like oh, okay. people want to know, would you like to know more what actually is covered week to week or I'm going to look at the chat. Yes. <laughs> Because mine is my my descriptions for my titles are fairly basic, and I'm seeing a lot of questions where people are asking, if you're a writer, can you take this course too? And so the format of the intensive craft is actually graphic novel storytelling. So we don't go over anything like perspective, anatomy, all the artistic stuff. I want you to bring that with you if you are an artist, but we're not going to be developing that unless it's in your critique group. What we're developing is visual storytelling. So the first Three of those weeks are actually devoted entirely to script, to plot, to characters and dialogue, to story. Um, now, the next three weeks, uh, visual narrative and comics. I know it's visual, but I actually have a term I like to use called visual writing. And this is where you write with pictures. And I intentionally structured it so that writers can take part in this too, because I do believe it's super important. Even if you're just writing the script, but not drawing the script, they're able to visualize how it's gonna look on a page. You may not know everything, but it helps you write a better script. And the only one where if you're a writer and it might not, uh, the only one of these actually that as a writer, you might not be able to take part in. It will there will be time in week eight where we talk more about technique, um, but there's actually stuff in there for writers too, like software. I there's 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 so much in this course, and it's it does cover ballooning, lettering, layout, composition, flow. It this is like college class, the four years of college. <laughs> cliff notes, <laughs> like cliff notes version. So I just want to get into that because I did feel like my syllabus is, um, it's not as obvious from the, it, the initial sort of, here's everything you're doing each week, exactly what we're getting into. Yeah, so I guess I, I'm not even sure what, I guess what I'll say about what I'm teaching in the um, publishing and the marketing and business part of the course is very much what I talked about in this masterclass, which is really about understanding who you are as a creator, what are your strengths and weaknesses? How can you focus on your strengths and kind of figure out your brand? How can you use that to inform what you do on your website? And we'll be doing a little hand-holding with helping you create a new website or polish up your existing website. How can you keep in touch with people with an email um, mailing list? What do you need to know about working with agents or approaching publishers or about publishing contracts? Um, and then finally, or actually not finally, and then how are you going to figure out your outreach? What works for you specifically? And let's set aside the comparisons to other people and think about what, what is feels of ease for you. And then how do you want to make money? How are you going to increase your um, income diversification? and what can you do? And then we're gonna end with an action plan so that when the course finishes, you have something laid out for yourself so you know what you need to do for the next 
three months and going forward from there. And so extras, we wanna talk a little bit about some of the cool extra stuff that we're doing in the intensive class. One, oh, Rizka, you should talk about this because this is yeah, something- Yeah, no, I'm super excited. So I went around and asked a bunch of creators who I love in Adore um, if I could borrow samples of their scripts. And they said, yes. So we have a whole bunch of sample scripts to share from actual published kid lit comics creators. These are a few, I'm still waiting on a few, so. <laughs> And so we'll actually, that'll be part of the program, but also you'll have access to view the scripts on your own too. I think that's so cool. Yeah. And then uh, we're gonna have a few uh, special guest stars. So one that is confirmed is Tim Stout, who's an editor at First Second. Um, and I can tell you, I have reached out to a couple people and there's a couple more people that I haven't reached out to yet, but I have a very good feeling about. So um, we, we, we don't have all the people we can announce yet, but it's gonna be really cool. Yeah, and Tim Stout, he's actually helping. So the very last class in craft is a live critique of your final project. And it'll be me, Jana, and Tim Stout, who is an editor at First Second. He's actually my editor on my creative writing book and he's phenomenal. I can say he's hands down the best editor I've ever worked with. His feedback is so spot on because he's both a writer and a creator and he understands comics so well. So I can't say how excited I am. I am super excited to have yes. Tim on the on, in the last um, lesson of my course. And then the other thing that we mentioned is that we want you to walk away from this course with something tangible, some, you know, a finished project that you can start showing to people, a website that is revamped that you feel really happy about. We're, in my part of the course, you'll have a few options for what your finished project is going to be, um, but the, the goal is that you are in a totally different place to, at the end of the 10 weeks than you were at the beginning. And you develop relationships with other people in the program. The, that is actually my favorite thing that has happened from the intensives that I taught in past years. I hear often from people telling me, I still meet with my peer group, my critique group. We still love each other and we we still help each other out. Oh my gosh, that makes me so happy. So I think I think I can pretty much guarantee that you will meet some new people who you really like. And then the final bonus is that you get access to Kids Comics Studio live events while you are a part of the Kids Comics Intensive Program. So Kids Comics Studio is our membership program in, inside of um, Kids Comics Unite. We do weekly events every Wednesday. They are lunch and learns or book club or um, office hours or creator interviews, agent creator interviews, editor interviews, all kinds of stuff like that. And you'll be able to access or you'll be able to uh, join those live events while you're part of the intensive course. And you already know who we are. We will be the people teaching. Rivka's teaching craft and I'm teaching marketing, publishing, and business. And all of our lessons are delivered live. So these are not replays. I deliberately structured the course like this because I believe that it is, you make so much more progress when you're part of a community and when you're actually getting a real person reacting to your work and discussing it with you rather than just watching passively like YouTube videos or something like that. So this part is really important to me. And I know that not everybody can come always at the times when we have um, the classes. So we always are posting replays within 24 hours. So if you can't come to a live lesson or a live office hour, you can always watch the replay. For office hours, you can submit questions in advance and then we can answer them during the office hour. Or of course, we'll answer them in the activity feed inside of Kids Comics Intensive. So the one thing I want to say is it is a time commitment. So if you want to make significant progress, you have to be willing to commit the time to it. Um, that's my one caveat to this. So as I said before, it's two different sessions. You can either sign up for one or for both. It's starting next week. And here's a, what you're probably waiting for, which is how much does it cost? So either session one or session two, the cost is a total of $999. And you pay this in three installments of $333. So it's once a month, you pay that $333 for three months. Or if you want the bundle, you pay $333 for 
for five months. So you're getting one month free. And so the total is $1,665. So that's the, I'm sure everybody's waiting. What is it, how much is this gonna cost? That's the cost. Uh, so how you enroll is you can go to the Kids Comics Unite website, our new website, spanking new. Um, and at the top on the menu bar, you'll see it says 2022 intensive. So you just click on that link and then you'll see the start now button on the Kids Comics Intensive page. And that takes you to this little plan section and you can choose which uh, plan that you wanna purchase, whether you wanna do session one or session two or both. And oh, I wanted to show you the testimonials that we've gotten from a few people. So we've had people who did the intensive like Jamie Ho is one example who worked on a piece during intensive last year and then sold it to a publisher. Yay! That's super exciting. And then we have Katie right, Riser who is currently shopping something to publishers. Patrick who just did a Kickstarter. Lex who self publishes his own work. So whether you're doing traditional publishing route, self publishing, Kickstarter, it, there's many different ways, many different paths that work for different people. So the intensive, my goal is definitely to help people whether they're doing the self-publishing route or the traditional publishing route. Both, you, very important to me. So enrollment is open now, yay! You can actually sign up. We've been talking about this and teasing it now for like a month or a month and a half or so, but you can actually sign up now. So, oh, and it ends, sorry, I should say enrollment is closing on Monday night at 11.59 p.m. Um, Lisa Lowry told me like, don't say midnight, it's confusing, which I agree is true. So we put 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. Um, this coming Monday is when we close enrollment. So from now until then, you can think about it and decide if you want to enroll. And we're beginning next week and we're ready to see you.